Okay, so we've talked a little bit about kind of the reasoning behind uh, these approaches, and we've talked more than a little bit about the assumptions behind them. And I think we've come to a pretty clear picture, well illustrated now, that our sampling needs to be very consistent in space, in time, in effort, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if it's, if it's not absolutely quantitatively consistent, then we know that we're violating some assumptions. We should probably assess to what degree we're, evalu we're violating those assumptions. And at the very least, we have to state that. You'd be surprised at how seldom people state the assumptions and the known violations of assumptions of things that they do. So let's just take a couple minutes and look at some species accumulation curves, just to get a feel for it. And a lot of this you can do by eye. So here's a paper, the relationship between regional and local species diversity in marine benthic communities, a global perspective. So they have samples from Palau, Norfolk, New Zealand, Eastern Caribbean, Southwest Africa, here we are, the Seychelles, Antarctica, Patagonia, Northeast Pacific, Galapagos, Iceland, and Gulf of Maine. And we're gonna see this kind of graph quite a bit. Here's the number of quadrats, so these are quarter meter square quadrat. So it's a half meter by a half meter. It looks like this research group um, used some um, standard approach where they're going out and they're sampling these small areas. And so this is the first quarter meter quadrat that they look at, and this is the tenth. And in some cases they get out to 73. Of course, in some cases, they're also down here in the range of 20, okay? Now, the, the, so the, the curves are color-coded by region, but essentially the point I want you to notice here is look at this inventory. This one, it's a little hard to trace back, but it clearly does something like that. Out here, let's say that's 50 species that they've seen on that inventory after 45 samples, okay? But notice they were close to 50, very close to 50, at 10 samples. They do 35 more samples and the number doesn't change. It's just like my rabbits and cats, right? Whereas this sample, look at this one, by at least 65 to 70 samples, they're still adding decent numbers of species to the inventory. And they're up around 300. Okay, so a lot of this you can do by using your eye. Here's a really interesting one, a relatively short inventory, only about 30 samples. But notice that it's linear and increasing essentially out to the end of the inventory. So they get this initial slug of species, that's just because they're seeing all the common stuff. But then every sample that they add to their inventory, they're adding species to the inventory. Okay, now, the question for you, or actually look at this one, this is a weird one. They start to plateau here, and then it starts to come up again. Don't know why. That kind of smells like heterogeneity of sampling. You know, maybe weather changed, currents changed, sampling changed, experts changed, who knows. So which is the richest fauna in this study? Sure looks like it's one of these two. But do we really know that this one or this one isn't going to keep going up? 
So that's kind of the, the challenge that we're facing with these, with these approaches. Here's another example. Species area and species individual relationships for tropical trees, comparison of 350 hectare plots. And so one, two, three plots, numbers of species, numbers of individuals. And this is species individual curves. Let's see, what's the difference between the two? I remember looking at this and not figuring it out then. Okay, this is semi-log and this is log-log. So essentially, the log-log plots are going to be kind of less obvious as far as, as changes when you, when you get up to larger numbers. Um, but essentially, let's look at this, where we're looking at the accumulation of species. In this Mudumalal, we think we start to see it tapering off. Um, with this BCI that's, that's in Panama, kind of don't. And with Pash, we kind of don't. Which is the richest? Hard to tell. Okay, I just want you to get a feel for what these, what these data look like. I personally would be awfully worried about making interpretations about how many species overlap between these, these samples because the inventories are not done. If you turn it to a log-log scale, it starts to taper off, but that's just because this distance here is 100 to 110, whereas this distance here is 10 to 11. Sorry, 10 to 20. So it's kind of hard to interpret the log log. I would use this. We care about each species generally. OK? Here's another one. Assessing biodiversity with species accumulation curves. Inventories of small reptiles by pit trapping in Western Australia. And this is kind of neat because this is something where my, my units of effort will be fairly independent of what humans do. Now it's true, if it's raining one day, it may be different than if it's been dry for a month. But essentially what they're doing is they've got one site that's very, very well sampled, and you can see that the, the inventory starts to taper off kind of looks like we're getting done. And then we have these three sites that are much less well sampled, but they seem to be going in different directions. This one kind of looks like it's got a pretty small fauna, and this one kind of looks like it's going to be really big. There are a couple of things in here that you ought to notice. Notice that. Okay, that little step there. That's a, a bellwether, a signal of heterogeneity. Essentially, if I'd shown you this, this inventory out to here, you'd say, well, it's tapering off right around 44 in a few thousand individuals. We haven't added a single species to the inventory. That curve is getting pretty flat. But then, in just a few hundred individuals, I had one, two, three, four, five steps. I'm detecting more and more species. That, you kind of don't expect a step. It could happen, but you don't expect a step like that if all of those samples are genuinely comparable. Maybe they moved their pitfalls. Maybe they hit some new habitat that wasn't in the original set. In some sense, it feels like they went into some beta diversity and not just alpha diversity. Okay? So a lot of this is, is being able to eyeball the data. Here we go, another one. Deep sea species richness, regional and local diversity estimates from quantitative bottom samples. 
number of samples, number of species. And again, we start to see them sort out, okay? None of these inventories looks like it is in any sense done, okay? And so we could chop through here. Essentially, we could take a criterion of effort and we could say, well, at 18 days, this one has 300 some species and this one has 260 species. But that's, that's a little perilous. It's a little bit dangerous. So we want to kind of be, be able to look at these, these results intelligently. Uh, species accumulation curve for agarics and boleti from a Caledonian pine wood. And so again, these data kind of made me a little scared. Nice flattening off here, a big step. That inventory is far from done. Just, we're just looking at this. So now let's think about uh, how we go beyond just eyeballing it. Okay, let's think about how do we start getting some numbers and confidence limits. You know, if I show you that, and I want to interpret that this curve, this site, or this sample has more species than this one, that works if the error bars are like this. But if the error bars are like this, it's all noise, right? That may just be random noise that makes this one look higher than this one. So we want to put some numbers on this. So an early attempt in this realm was uh, developed by Jorge Soberón and Jorge Llorente. Um, Soberón was supposed to be here presenting this lecture to you but he got really busy and he traveled too much in the spring and so he decided he couldn't come. So that's why you have me two days this week, okay? So if you don't like it, complain to Soberon, okay? But they, they started doing some interesting things, essentially going beyond just looking at the curves and eyeballing them. Uh, and essentially what they did was they explored some data sets. Here's an uh, accumulation curve for butterflies in Paquitza, Peru. They were essentially just pulling data from publications that had provided the original data, the presence-absence matrix, effectively. And what they're doing is they're fitting curves. So essentially, if you can assume that this sampling, in this case the unit of sampling is person hours, if you can assume that each of these person hours had an equal probability of detecting a new species to the inventory, we know that's a bad assumption, we know. But if you can either assume that it doesn't make that much difference or just live with it, State your assumption and live with it. Well then, you can take the shape of this curve. And I showed you some curves in the examples where it's just obvious. You know, if, if one of these curves went like this and then absolutely flat for another 600 person hours didn't detect a single additional species, then it's obvious. But most inventory data look kind of like this. See, there are the actual data. They go out to 200 person hours. And so what Soberon and Jorente do is they take three different curve types. A is the logarithmic curve. B corresponds to this equation from Clench. And C is an exponential curve. They're essentially saying, given the temporal pattern of accumulation of species knowledge, what's the probable full number of species? 
So in this case, what they're doing is they're saying, well, the data sample for 200, 200 person hours. If we went out and sampled for 400 person hours more, how many species would we likely add to the list? So at the end of the inventory, 570, more or less, species had been detected. If you use an exponential equation, you get an answer that the real fauna probably has 620. So 560 to 620 were mostly done. But if you use a logarithmic approach, then you say, oh, no, we've got like 870 species. And we're not even halfway, well, we're, we're, we're not even three quarters of the way there. Okay, so what they were doing was, was exploring the implications of these three curve shapes. They also used a, a data set for butterflies at Powder Mill Reserve, which is north of Pittsburgh. And again, you see these three um, approaches giving very different answers. You know, is the final fauna size 71 or 83? You've detected, oops, you've detected like 73, and the exponential approach says that there are only 71. So there, right away, we're kind of unhappy with that approach. Um, so these were estimators, and they were based on essentially the form of accumulation of knowledge. Going to be very, very sensitive, and Soberon and Jorente were conscious of this, very sensitive to the temporal pattern of accumulation, any bias in those units of effort. Good day, bad day, smart observer, dumb observer, uh, easy trail, hard trail, any of that's going to be in there. 